there's a moment in every subject when the standard explanation starts to feel wrong. Like you understand the procedure, but not the idea behind it. That moment happens very early in an integration. We're told to think of it like this. Cut the domain into rectangles, make them thinner, add up the area. And we accept it, because it works. But it was never the real idea. Rectangles are just a crutch, a geometric prosthetic used to approximate something simpler. Forget geometry for a second. Imagine just taking points, looking at the value of f at each one and averaging. That's integration in its purest form. Everything else, Riemann sums, partitions, measure theory, was just invented simply to control how those points are chosen. And once you see it this way, the idea scales beautifully, from one dimension, to regions, to spaces too wide for partitions. This is episode one of our four-part series. Our goal is not to add definitions, but to strip the integration down until only the essence remains, and then watch how everything else falls naturally into place. Welcome to Integrals Done Right, how integration should be taught. We we'll begin with the familiar construction, rectangles beneath a curve. But instead of accepting it as a formula, we'll pay attention to what it's actually doing. Take one bar. Its width is delta x. Its height is the function evaluated at the bar's midpoint. Here it's x3. So its contribution is delta x times f of x3. Now repeat this for each bar and add the contributions. All bars have the same width, so delta x factors out naturally. On the interval between a and b, that width is delta x equals to b minus a divided by 6 currently, which means this expression is simply interval length multiplied by the average of the function evaluations at those equidistant chosen points. That's the quiet insight. We are evaluating f at specific points and averaging those values. Refine the subdivision. More points, more evaluations. The number change, but the structure stays the same. Length of the interval times the average of evaluations. In the limit, this becomes our integral. Soon we will stop relying on rectangles entirely and from that single shift everything else will follow. So we evaluated the function at more and more equally spaced points and averaged those values. That worked, but not because of the rectangles. It worked because the points themselves were distributed evenly across the interval. Let's make that idea precise. So we take a sequence of points xk inside the interval between a and b and we look at how it spreads across this interval. And now we choose a sub-interval between u and v. And among the first n points, we count how many land inside the sub-interval and compare that to the total number n. If this proportion settles to the ratio of lengths, where we define the length of an interval by the difference between the end point and its starting point, we say that the sequence is uniform on the interval between a and b. And this is not a statement about a single interval. The same limit must hold for every choice of subinterval. The proportion must always match its share of length. So if one uniform sequence makes the average converge, does that mean every uniform sequence will? Let's test the easiest case first. On the unit interval, take the function which is always constant 1. Evaluate f at evenly spaced points and form the running average. Every term is 1. The average stays at 1. So here any uniform sequence will give the same value 1. Now change just one ingredient, the function. So we define our function to be 1 
if x is irrational and to be zero if x is rational. The question remains. If one uniform sequence converges, must they all? Here's a classical uniform sequence. Those terms are all rational. The details of the sequence itself are not so important for us, but every evaluation for the sequence will be zero. The running average will stick at zero. Now, a uniform sequence with no rational terms at all is the irrational rotation. So, evaluate f along it, and every evaluation is 1. The running average sits at 1. So, the answer is no. For this function, different uniform sequences can give different limiting averages. Why this matters? Our averaging perspective forces a choice. If we want the integral to be well-defined for a function on our interval between a and b, then we must demand that every uniform sequence produce the same limit. And exactly this becomes our definition of Riemann integrable. When even one uniform sequence disagrees, the function is not Riemann integrable. The principle of defining an integral through averaging along a uniform sequence goes back to Hermann Weil. He showed that on the unit interval, uniform sequences are enough to recover the usual integral, no rectangles required. We're now taking this idea farther, out of intervals into higher dimensions, into regions where partitions become messy and impossible, and we'll see that the same averaging principles survive unchanged. Seen this way, Riemann and other more complicated integration theories are just different degrees of control over how points explore space. Not different integrals, but different fairness conditions on sequences. So, we're leaving the line and moving into multi-dimensions. Our basic domain is now a hyperbox. On the line, the only geometric number we needed was length. Here, the analog is volume. You can think of each factor as one edge length of the box. Multiply the edge lengths and you have the size of the box we're averaging over. We now promote the idea to d dimensions. Our domain is a hyperbox Q. The notion of correct distribution is measured against axis aligned subboxes inside of Q. So, we take a sequence xk in Q, and for every axis aligned subbox B, which is a subset of Q, look at the proportion of the first n terms that lie in B. Uniform in Q means that this proportion has a limit and it equals the share of volume of B inside Q. In one dimension, length guided the proportions. Here, volume plays the same role. With this definition in place, our evaluate and average viewpoint extends to d dimensions without changing the core idea. We now collect everything into a single statement. Let Q be our hyperbox. We say that F is Riemann integrable on Q if one condition holds. For every uniform sequence inside of Q, meaning every sequence that distributes itself correctly across all subboxes, the average settles to a single value, independent of which uniform sequence we choose. That common limit defines the integral. And multiplying it by the volume of this hyperbox Q gives the classical normalization. To make this concrete, we can watch a uniform sequence exploring the box, evaluating f at each point, average the values, and see the limits stabilize. Every axis aligned region is visited in the correct proportion, so the running average flattens towards the true integral. No rectangles required. This is Riemann integration, re-expressed as a uniform average over space. We're now ready to integrate on an arbitrary bounded domain D. The move is simple. Place D inside a box Q and then use the indicator trick. So we evaluate f on a whole box, but the only points inside d contribute. This also fixes the notion of volume for d. 
adjust the integral with the constant function d with respect to this bounded domain d. On the right, q is the square outline. d is the yellow region, here drawn with two components. Points in d are shown in yellow, points outside remain white. Multiplying by the indicator function with respect to d is exactly this coloring. Values inside d are kept, values outside are ignored. Nothing else changes. Our averaging viewpoint now runs on q. The indicator simply filters contributions to those that lie in d. With this, integration over any bounded region reduces to one uniform framework on a single box. So we've rebuilt the integral as an averaged evaluation over uniformly distributed points. Now watch what that buys us. Linearity is a one-liner. Averages distribute over sums and constants in every finite block. So the limit does too. Monotonicity is just as direct. If f is smaller or equal than g for all x, then each finite average obeys the same inequality and the limit preserves it. Additivity on domains follows from a single identity with indicators. Along any uniform sequence, averages respect that equality term by term. If the intersection between the set A and B is negligible, the last piece vanishes and we get this equality. The point is not the algebra, it's the clarity. Once the integral is an average over a uniform exploration of the domain, the usual properties stop being theorems to memorize and become immediate consequences. In the next part, we'll push the idea farther. By adjusting what uniform means, we'll see why the Lebesgue integral is the natural refinement of the same picture and why it handles many more functions without adding conceptual weight.